Hello, everyone. Welcome to Genealogy Adventures. My name is Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. Um, how are you guys today? I hope everybody is well. Hope you guys are having a great Sunday. And we have a great show for you today. Yes, we do. So I want to get right on it and um, introduce to you Mr. Cameron Patterson. Cameron is the um, executive director at the Robert Russa. I always get this, it's like a tongue twister. <laughs> Robert Russa Moton Museum. That is a historic landmark in Prince Frederick County, Virginia. And he um, he is the executive director there. He has he does a lot of work with them. I'm sorry, Prince Edward County. And he does a lot of work with the civil rights and education. He's growing the staff support there and everything. So I just want to welcome you to the show, Cameron. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm very yeah. excited to be with you. Yeah, we're excited too. I know this show was something that I really wanted to get into. <laughs> yes, you and me both, and we have learned so much about the, the, the history of the movement that, that actually came out of that school. So we're going to be spending a lot of time today talking about one student in particular, but it's worth remembering that while um, her name is kind of out there, that she has the support of 451 other students from the uh, Robert Russo Moton High School. So her name is Barbara Johns. And at 16, uh, she, along with um, about a third of the, the other students, um, basically staged a walkout. Um, they were fighting for, remember this is Jim Crow, this is Virginia. So it was, on, it was operating under a school system that was separate and supposedly equal. So interestingly, the White's High School and the Black High School roughly had, if I remember correctly, the same number of students, but the disparity between the, the buildings and, and all the, the structures was, was quite marked. So Cameron, the first kind of question I wanted to, to lay at you was if you could talk a little bit about the disparity between those two, two different high schools. Definitely, I think it's important uh, before you talk about that 51 student walkout to really paint the picture of the situation in which those students face. Um, Robert Russell Moton High School was the first standalone all black high school that was built in Prince Edward County. And that school was built in 1939. That school was built for 180 students. And by the second year of its occupancy, we had about 215 students enrolled. And in the decade that would follow leading up to that student walkout, we would have 450 students attending school in this high school building. Uh, this high school, uh, when you compared it to the all white facilities in the county and even other all black high schools across the Commonwealth, um, there were a lot of inadequacies in which the students, the faculty, and the staff faced. Um, for example, when it came to the science laboratory, there was only one science laboratory in the school. There was one microphone in that science laboratory. Uh, mm. the books that the students had access to were hand-me-down books from the all-white schools that typically arrived to them with racial epithets uh, that were uh, written in them. And additionally, if you think about it, those textbooks really uh, perpetuated a narrative um, related to history uh, that is certainly not the narrative that we seek uh, to communicate today. Uh, so the inadequacies were strong. Um, Farmville High School was the prime high school that was raised in the local case that would become a part of Brown v. Board. And one of the things that the lawyers would do as a part of that case was to really use the photo evidence to tell the story as it related to the inequalities. And so with that photo evidence, you saw that Farmville High School had a gymnasium, a fixed seat auditorium, a separate cafeteria, a nursing station, um, separate bathrooms for faculty and staff, and Robert Russell Moton High School had none of that. Um, and so the inadequacies were strong. 
And it was really the students who knew that they deserved better. Um, and that was what uh, this fight became about. Um, initially, that fight wasn't to integrate. Uh, that fight was to get that new school facility. Mm. And to put it into a context, <clears throat> so this is 1951, because um, I was actually doing the math in my head and I, I didn't realize what a precursor this was in the, the overall civil rights movement. So it's 1951. This means this was four years before the Montgomery um, bus boycott. Right. And this was nine years before the famous Wool Woolworths, see, I'm having a tongue twister moment myself, Wool Woolworths counter lunch sit in. So, I mean, this was by and far way ahead of those. So in terms of the NAACP and like black community leaders and black civil rights leader in the state, of, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, what kind of initial support was there or even conversations about disparity in, in educational settings? You know, um, that's a good point. Uh, we, we really, dub this uh, history, and I, I kind of frame it as the Moton story, uh, when you talk about that 13-year struggle from 51 through 64 when schools reopen. So with the Moton story, um, you know, I think it's important to realize that, you know, 51 wasn't the first time that you see this idea of activism and advocacy brewing within the county. Uh, there was certainly a long history of that. Um, we go back to the work of the, Mar uh, the Council for Colored Women led by Martha E. Forrester. That group of women really advocated for that standalone all black high school to be built. That group of women raised money to fund the educators that would teach um, so that they could extend high school grades uh, from the seventh grade to the 11th and 12th grades. Um, so that activism was there. Uh, it would be further brought along by the work of Reverend L. Francis Griffin, uh, John Lancaster with the Parent Teacher Association. And so the students saw that. Um, but again, they realized that even with the work that their parents and community leaders were doing, that the change they desired wasn't happening at the pace in which they thought it should be happening. So before I get to the kind of stonewalling from the, I guess, the, the state point of view or the county point of view, you were talking about fundraising. This is the first time I've, um, I've, I've heard about that. What kind of fundraising, what forms did that fundraising take? So, you know, really uh, with the work of the Martha E. Forrester Council, that fundraising was a combination of individual contributions uh, from community leaders um, and then events that they would put forward as an organization uh, to raise the money to not only pay for the teachers, uh, so that they could extend those grades, but to also, through the years, uh, provide the resources for those uh, Black students in Prince Edward County that the county wasn't providing um, as a way to help level the playing field as best that they could. And I guess for clarification for our audience, were Black teachers and white teachers in a um, Prince Edward County, just, just sticking with this one county, were they paid, I know that they weren't paid the same wage, but were they paid in the same way? Were, was the county and the state paying both of them? So they were paid, uh, just not paid equally. Got it. Um, and so they were contracted uh, for their work, uh, but just at a much uh, lesser value and rate uh, than those teaching in the white schools. So that really, that that would be, that really speaks to the, the passion of education within our community. It does. Uh, and that would really be uh, some of Oliver Hill, Spotswood Robinson, and that legal team's first work in Virginia uh, was the school equalization uh, pay cases that they would wage um, in communities like Norfolk, Virginia. 
Wow, you said Norfolk. I went to school in Virginia Beach, so you just said, <laughs> wow. Now, the bit that has fried my noodle is doing my background research on this, um, stumbled across, across the fact that I suppose those in power in Prince Edward County were so affronted by the audacity of asking for equal education, they shut the whole school system down. And they didn't just shut it down for a couple of weeks. I mean, they shut it down for years. They shut it down for five years. Um, you know, there were other communities uh, following. So this all happens post Brown v. Board of Education. Mm -hmm. uh, so the decision comes out in 54. There's a Brown two decision that comes out in uh, 1955. Uh, so typically when you argue a legal uh, case before the court, you're supposed to do two things. You're supposed to remedy the constitutional question, uh, which that was remedied uh, as it relates to um, the desegregation of public schools. But additionally, you're supposed to set the timeline for how that decision will be implemented. Um, and so the court didn't do that um, in that first Brown decision. And so with Brown two, they come back and they say, uh, that um, desegregation of public schools must happen uh, with all deliberate speed. Um, and, you know, Oliver Hill famously um, quit that, uh, you know, that really meant, um, that didn't really mean a lot uh, when you use that word with all deliberate speed. Um, and so they really kind of punt that back to the federal court and so you see communities across Virginia, across the country, really drag their feet as it relates to integrating. Um, and so Virginia kind of goes through this massive resistance period where you're pushing back at this Brown decision and doing everything that you can not to integrate. Um, and so as massive resistance falls at the state level all eyes turn to Prince Edward County. Um, and Prince Edward County, our local board of supervisors decides that they will not fund public education um, effectively closing schools for that five year period. So you have all of this activity going on and what I, what I often feel and sense is a very kind of sleepy, quiet, very rural part of Virginia is now this hotbed of national attention. I mean, that, that couldn't have gone down very well. No, um, you know, it was, um, I guess in some ways Farmville was a primed place for this to happen um, mm -hmm. in terms of the local leadership and how they operated, uh, the connections that that local leadership had at the statewide level. Um, we had individuals in our community, such as uh, Jay Barry Wall, who was editor of the Farmville Herald, who was really using that paper um, as a way to uh, push back at the notion of this student walkout, at the notion of the legal effort that had come out of Prince Edward. Um, there was this belief as well that you know, what they tried to say is Blacks don't pay into the tax base um, as much as their white counterparts. So we can't possibly make that same level of investment. Uh, just, the super, go ahead. What? Can I just jump in there? But how could we as a people when we were at, we're, we were being discriminated against and institutionally and every level, we weren't paid the same. It was more difficult to get jobs. There were occupations that wouldn't dream of hiring a black person. So we didn't have the same kind of salaries as the, the white town folk would have to be able to contribute in forms of tax dollars. I think absolutely right. And I think that was ultimately kind of went to this notion that if you keep a group of people suppressed in terms of their economic opportunity, then that allows you the ability to hold on to the power structure in a more deepened way. Um, and so, you know, our county leaders and leadership were very masterful 
um, at playing those uh, types of games. Um, and so those are the things that they um, said as a way to continuously delay this effort um, to build a new school building. And these are the things that began to frustrate those student leaders that would walk out in 1951. Um, you know, for example, um, when, you, when it came to overcrowding in the late 1940s, the county constructs on the high school property three tar paper shack buildings. So to alleviate overcrowding in today's schooling situation, you would construct modular classroom buildings. And so these tar paper shack structures were their modern modular solution to overcrowding. But these structures were poorly built. Students referred to them as adult sized chicken coops. Mm -hmm. And it was really something that angered the students um, and was really something that irritated Barbara deeply that the county would think that low of these students that they would construct these structures. So getting into Barbara, one thing that I'm confused about is I see mention that she gave a public address, but I haven't, I've spent a week trying to find the words that she actually said. Did she actually give a public address? And if she did, is that, is that script or is that, is that text available somewhere? So that's a good question. Um, so we go by, you know, the, the great thing uh, is that we've got a number of individuals who were present on the day of that walkout, whose uh, recollection we can turn to. Uh, we're very fortunate that uh, there were some early writings about what took place here in Prince Edward County uh, with authors such as Bob Smith, and I've got his book here, They Closed Their Schools. Uh, one of the foundational um, history summonizations of what happened here in Prince Edward County. So we're very fortunate that we've got these resources to turn to. Um, as it relates to the student walkout, um, you know, we, when we were conceptualizing the museum, we put together this film strike a call to action that's a dramatization of that student walkout. And so we turn to those firsthand accounts from those that were there. Uh, we turn to historical accounts written by Bob Smith and others. Uh, we turn to um, journal entries that Barbara had put together uh, to really capture um, what happened and what took place on that day. So. Um, it's not an exact replication of what was said, uh, but it is uh, fairly close based on the ideas, um, based on those accounts. So, so I wanted to, I wanted, if, if I can come in for a second, I wanted to actually learn more about Barbara. Like what, I know you're sitting here talking about giving us an example of what made her move forward but what was like that final straw what what was that what was that final thing that just made her say you know what i deserve better schooling i need to you know and in order for me to get better schooling i gotta get up and do this because one of the things that is going to be a theme for this month is learning what made these people move forward and do what they did so can you give an idea or something like that? That's a good question. I, I think it's a couple of things. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll kind of walk through that. So I think it is um, just the fact that even as young students, they were very in tune to the work that their parents were doing as it related to this issue of trying to get the county to build a new school building or expand upon the existing Robert Russell Moton High School site. So we've got that playing. Um, additionally, it was the construction of those tar paper shacks that happens around 1948. Um, additionally, I would say too, for Barbara, 
she was an individual that was highly involved in student life at Robert Russell Moton High School. She was a leader on the student council. Um, and as a result of that leadership role, she has the opportunity to travel the state visiting high schools such as um, J. Solomon Russell in Lawrenceville, uh, Ralph Bunch in King George and other schools. And these are all black schools. And she comes to see that those schools are in far better shape than what was available to the black students in Prince Edward uh, County. And uh, so as a result of these travels, as a result of hearing stories from her classmates who had the opportunity to see what was offered at Farmville High, you begin to kind of realize that, man, my high school is a blight on this right. county. Um, man, we are getting far less uh, than what is being made available to others. Um, and so I think it's a collection of things that really speak to her and her desire. Um, there's a story as well, you know, her sister always says, her sister Joan Johns Cobbs uh, talks about just how reflective of an individual Barbara was um, and, you know, just kind of spending a lot of time in the woods, uh, journaling as a way to kind of collect and gather her thoughts. Um, you know, she really takes these frustrations to um, a music teacher at Moton that she was close to by the name of Inez Davenport. And Miss Davenport says, uh, why don't you do something about it? And I think uh. initially Barbara views that as Miss Davenport being dismissive. But when she really sits down and thinks about it, it's like, well, man, why can't I do something about it? Um, and that's exactly what she's able to do. So I think it's a collection of things that really speak to her. Um, I will share this story. It's one of the stories that we share as part of the museum experience. So this event would have happened after the planning for the walkout had gotten underway. And so with that walkout planning process, Barbara, so she's got this idea and she recognizes that I can't carry this out by myself. I'm going to need the help of my classmates to make this a reality. And she also quickly recognizes that if you're gonna lead a strike, it's gotta be all or it really isn't gonna work. Uh -huh. And so, um, you know, the strike, oh yeah. So the strike kind of, the planning process probably starts towards the end of 1950. And so this event takes place um, in the spring of 1951, prior to that April walkout. Uh, there was a bus accident in the Elam community of Prince Edward County. Uh, that claimed the lives of um, a number of young students. Um, and so one of the first inequalities that you would probably see as a student were the buses. Because you would see the brand new buses ride by you carrying students to the all-white high school. And so there's this story that Barbara writes about about being late one day to catch the bus. Um, and, you know, she sends her siblings on to get on the bus to head to school. Um, and Barbara sees this half empty brand new bus riding by her, knowing that it's going to the all white high school in Farmville, that it's got to pass Moton to get to that all white high school. And, you know, that frustrates her uh, just to know that things are the way they are to the point where these types of inequalities are able to stand. Um, and so kind of going back to that incident in Elam, that bus accident was really the result of the fact that you've got this old hand-me-down bus that's been given 
to the students attending the all black schools that really should have been put out of use. It was, it was out of, it should, it was no good anymore. Definitely. And it stalls on those train tracks. Uh, the mm. bus driver frantically trying to get that bus restarted. And before everyone uh, could get off the bus, it claims the lives of five students. Jesus. Uh, so in Prince Edward County, you kind of come to see at this point that inequalities are starting to claim lives. And for the students, if there was ever any doubt about what they were looking to do as it relates to that strike, that incident's kind of a reaffirmation that we've got to move forward, that this is too important to turn back. So this is yet another, uh, just another, um, I mean, technically you could just relate that to another racial incident towards black people and not caring, because I've never heard even doing, doing the research, I've never heard that story about these students' lives being claimed because they were given a hand-me-down bus. I mean, that's just basically what it was. Yeah, I mean, you look at, so I've got um, museum volunteers that attended Moton who share with me that you might be a 16-year-old student and get called upon to drive the bus to carry your classmates to school. Wow. That was not wow. an uncommon thing uh, because from a school system standpoint, you just didn't invest in um, bus drivers for the all black schools as you might uh, for the all white schools. Uh, one of our museum volunteers, uh, Everett Berryman um, says at 16 years of age, he was the bus driver uh, carrying his classmates um, to and from school. Mm, so there wasn't so, even that duty of care. Definitely. And so like any, so at this point, it's like inequalities are placing extra burden amongst students. Uh, you know, at, no 16 year old student should be responsible uh, for that. Yeah. Burden, but, to, but to their credit, to care for for students, right? But to their credit, not that they should, have, but they stepped up, and, and they, they did. did what they had to. Yeah. And so how did from, this? Absolutely. Go ahead, Brian. And following on from Donnie's question, so in today's lingo, we we would say that Barbara had black girl magic, and I'm just yes. curious. I'm just curious how that black girl magic played out in 1950s. And um, and farm job. How how did that go down? Well, I tell you, um, as they were going through this planning process, I mean, they knew that, man, we're we're going to step out and do something that has never been done, and there's the possibility that our parents, our teachers, could be impacted as a result of our action. Um, and so they were very concerned about that. And that's why this remained a student-led initiative uh, because they didn't want to bring um, their parents or teachers into that planning process. Um, and so after this strike takes place, um, you know, the school leadership needed someone to blame. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, the principal, uh, M. Boyd Jones, loses his job um, following the student walkout. Um, and I think, unfortunately, there are safety concerns that Barbara and her family have to deal with, uh, which results in Barbara moving to Montgomery, Alabama, following the student walkout. So she, unfortunately, never graduates from Robert R. Moton High School uh, she would graduate from uh, school in Montgomery. Um, and, you know, her sisters and her siblings and her sister and brothers talk about the fact that it wasn't until well after that they even knew that that was the reason she had to relocate to Montgomery. Uh. Um, you know, her parents just told her 
Barbara wants to go stay with her cousins for a while. Um, and that's what they were told and what they accepted. Um, I think, unfortunately, um, you know, the John's family's home uh, would be um, become subject to arson um, a few years later following that student walkout. And so there were certainly consequences uh, paid. Um, and the biggest is just having to leave a community um, in which your family resided here, uh, a community in which you grew up, having to leave your classmates, to leave all the things that you had come to love and know about your school experience. Um, so there were certainly a lot of sacrifices uh, that came as a result of this action. Mm. So how did Brown, um, how, how did this particular case get involved with the Brown versus Board? Because we want everybody to realize her case went, this, this went, this went national and it went national and you weren't taught about it going national. So I want people to understand that. How did it get connected with the Brown versus Board? Yeah, so that's a good uh, question. So in the wake of the student strike, uh, the student planning committee would meet with the school board chairman and the school superintendent to reiterate their demands. Uh, they also met with an individual by the name of Reverend L. Francis Griffin, uh, who is an important civil rights leader in our community. Um, and Reverend Griffin helped to connect uh, members of that student planning team with the legal team from the NAACP's Richmond office. Um, and so Barbara Johns and a student by the name of Carrie Stokes, who was a member of that planning committee, write a letter uh, to Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson um, asking if they would come to Farmville to meet with them. Um, and that is something that uh, they both agreed to do. Um, and at the time they agreed to come meet with the students, they never thought that they would become involved and take this on as a legal effort. Uh, they had potential cases brewing in other communities across the Commonwealth. Um, and they never really felt initially that Prince Edward was the right place for this type of uh, legal effort uh, because they didn't feel like uh, Prince Edward was ready um, in terms of, um, they, didn't, they didn't feel like Prince Edward was primed for the fight, if you will. Um, and so, but when they come to meet with the students, um, that changes. They're impressed by the resolve uh, that those students demonstrate. Uh, they're impressed with the fact that the students were very well aware of what they were doing, why they were doing it, and what the next steps had to be in order to move forward. Um, and so they agree uh, to become involved, but a couple of things needed to happen. You needed to gain the support of your parents and the community, and you needed to agree to fight for full-on integration. Uh, because by this point, the NAACP's legal strategy had began to shift and no longer were they fighting these one-on-one -on -one school equalization cases with individual counties. They were ready to take on uh, the entire system um, in order to desegregate public schools. That's amazing. So, so it's amazing that one of my favorite stories, um, you know, so I, I can imagine Barbara standing on that stage in front of her classmates, um, sharing all the reasons that they should walk out. Uh, but then I also think about uh, a community meeting that was held at First Baptist Church um, in which the NAACP officials would explain to the community uh, what a case challenging segregation might look like. 
And I just also think of Barbara Johns taking to the pulpit of First Baptist Church, um, a packed audience and really um, kind of laying out the case to the community about the need to, um, about their decision to strike and the need to move forward with this effort. So um, just amazing. I mean, I, I know who I was as a 16 year old um, uh -huh. coming through high school and uh, for all the good qualities I might have had uh, I don't know if you I would have done that I don't yeah. know if I been trying to do something um, on this scale I, I think it just says a lot about who these students were um, I think it says a lot too about how these students were raised yeah uh, it says a lot about the fact that you know, they love their teachers. They love their school experience. They just knew they deserved better. So yeah, they were basically saying we get the whole separate thing, but we're sure I'm seeing too much of each. I, <laughs> I mean, it's amazing to me. Cause like you said, you know, at 16 years old, you just, you, it's not even in your mindset to have to do something like this. and. I didn't start thinking about what was in my mindset until the Central Park or the Exonerated Five now that they call them. Yeah. It wasn't, yeah. I didn't start thinking about that until I could actually relate myself to the fact that while I was going to the concerts at 16 years old and meeting all of the, the rappers and all that stuff in Virginia Beach, there was a dude that was my age that was in an adult prison fighting for his life. And I knew nothing about it. And I didn't, and it didn't, it didn't even come past me. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, that's what hurt me most when I first saw that particular show. So I'm like, where was my mind? Why wasn't I, why wasn't I doing these, you know, why wasn't I fighting for stuff and, and doing it, but I didn't, I didn't have to, or I didn't think about it. it. It was at that point that I realized that we really got comfortable back by that time. Like when I was a teenager, we were very comfortable with where we were and we were, we felt very equal and we felt all these different things and we were very comfortable and we stopped fighting. We literally just stopped fighting. And now look at us now. We're back to fighting again. You know, uh, at the museum, we lead this activity that we call the strike activity uh, with students as they finish their tour experience. And it really allows the students to put themselves in the mindset of that student strike committee and to think about issues in your community, in your school, in the way in which the student strike committee members would have thought about it. Like, you know, think about your why, think about who your stakeholders are, think about the consequences that will potentially come if you were to move forward with trying to create this type of change. And the thing that I love about it is that students really walk away with this realization that the change you seek to create doesn't have to be as big as a student walkout. It doesn't have to lead to some groundbreaking Supreme Court case. Uh, that change is big or small, dependent upon um, the circumstance you're in or what you're seeking to fight for. Uh, I mean, it's the shame of this country that it pushes particularly non-white people to those extremes, to have to fight because it's never a reasonable, rational conversation. It's resistance, resistance. Okay, we're gonna to have to take this to the Supreme Court. Just for once, I would love for it to not have to go that way. To say, yes, what's happening is yeah. wrong and let's just change it. Let's not have to make this into a nasty legal battle. It's wrong, we're wrong, change it. Right, right. So I'd like to spend the, the last part of the show kind of talking about the recognition that um, Barbara's receiving, because as we said before, uh, before the show started, it's a shame. This is, we're talking 1950s. It's now, you know, she started to get national recognition in 2020 and 2021. So there's two things. There's the 
she was inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame. Um, it's Utica, New York, I believe that's that's where that that's located. And also what's happening with her statue, because both of those are really exciting things. Yeah, you know, it's uh, really exciting. Uh, and, you know, I think it's exciting not only for her um, and the important recognition she's receiving, but I love it because I think as folks come to know who she was, it kind of prompts them to want to know more about Prince Edward County um, and how this story plays out more fully. So as you come to learn about her, you also realize that there were 450 classmates that joined her. As you come to know about her, you recognize that there's a community that stays and continues to fight, uh, particularly as public schools close in 1959 here in Prince Edward County. Uh, so I think it's opened up so many opportunities uh, for folks to know that more fully. Um, and, you know, I have often said that, particularly as it relates to the statue in the National Statuary Hall collection, uh, Virginia had an opportunity to send a profound message uh, with the individual that they selected to replace Robert E. Lee. Um, and I think it was a message that really would communicate to the world what Virginia's world. values were uh, as a state. Um, it would communicate that the Virginia that we were in the past um, is not who we want to be moving forward. And additionally too, I think just the fact that you're sending forth a young person, um, I think is just gonna speak powerfully to the young visitors uh, that come through the Capitol each year. Uh, you know, I just vividly think about the image of a young person looking up um, into her eyes mm. and hopefully seeing in her someone that they can inspire to be like. Um, and that is a person that is committed to leading change, big or small, um, and that hopefully there'll be a person that has the courage to do that. Um, which well, like a whole generation cool. of girls who can look at Kamala Harris and be inspired. Yes. Right. For those that don't know, um, what he's talking about is Barbara is actually replacing the Robert E. Lee, the Robert e. Lee statue in the Capitol. Um, you don't have a date or anything for that as of yet, right? No date. Uh, so the Commission on Statues in the U.S. Capitol uh, made their recommendation. Um, and there were five amazing finalists, uh, Oliver Hill, uh, Pocahontas, and a number of other individuals. So, you know, they really did their work um, in putting that final list together. Uh, so now that their recommendation has been passed forward, the Gen General Assembly has to affirm that recommendation via a resolution from each body, the Senate and the House. And so that legislative process is underway currently. And so the resolutions have both passed the Senate and the House. Now they have to be swapped and voted on once again. Um, so we're excited to see that move forward. And thus far, it's uh, been a unanimous um, path forward for that. Really good to hear. And while we're on this subject about the statue, um, whatever I want to know what racist and white supremacists are thinking, I head straight to YouTube and I head straight to Twitter. And there were some really, really wonderful videos about her, about the statue and the being in the, in the Congress. And there was a stream of comments going, well, you know, this is reverse racism. This is oppression against white people. This is going to stoke the fires of divisions like they could possibly be stoked any more than they already are. But this is my question to both of you. What are your thoughts? I mean, how do we get past that and trying to get recognition for the bravery of a 16 year old girl who was probably getting death threats in 1951? How do you counter that this is reverse racism? 
You can go first, Cameron. I got I I <laughs> Well, you know, it's uh, interesting that you say that just because, you know, those are the things that we hear in our own community uh, as it relates to the preservation work around the Robert Russell Moton High School. You know, folks wanted to see that building bulldozed uh, because they just always had this belief. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, let's put it out of sight, out of mind. Uh, let's, let's not rehash old wounds. Um, and I think to myself, well, whose wounds are they? Um, you know, mm. are you thinking about the wounds of those who were locked out of schools or those who um, went on strike? Um, or are you thinking about uh, yourself um, in a selfish manner? Um, and so those are things that we went through. Um, and I think you've just got to uh, be persistent. Uh, you know, we had a group of women, that same Council for Colored Women that advocated for that school to be built uh, was later renamed the Martha E. Forrester Council. And that's the same group of women that fought to keep that building uh, from being sold to a developer and becoming uh, the next restaurant um, in this county. Um, and so persistence matters um, in terms of how you have to push through the noise uh, because you know that doing so is the right thing to do. Tanya? Well, that, that's awesome. So, okay. <laughs> so, okay. My feeling on this whole thing is I can actually revert back to the post that you and I were talking on earlier with, um, about Utah and the kids being able to opt out of black history. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you know about that, but apparently Cameron in Utah, the kids are opting out of learning about black history. They, they have that option, right? That, that, that's what you say, wow. So my thing, my thing is if you don't learn the true history, you're always going to have some type, somebody who's just not going to know. They're going to be, they're going to be ignorant to what actually went on in America as a whole. And they're not going to understand. So you end up with people who, you end up with the people who are just coming out their mouths saying things that really sounds extremely, extremely dumb. And you're looking at them like, did you not read the book? Or did you not see why this happened in that way? And I just, I feel like um, I can go back to, to other things. Like when we did the Green Book, and how so many of those places are now gone because they want to wipe away the history. And you cannot wipe away a history like that. It's going to show. It's going to rear. Well, again. And it's going to come up. And you, you can't keep telling people. You can't keep telling people, oh, we'll just cover up that wound and, and it'll be okay and everything. No, it's not because it's a wound that's cut, that's so deep that if you don't take care of it, it's going to get infected and it's going to get really bad. And that's what this is. That's what black, that's what history is to me. If you don't take care of what it is that you're hiding, it's going to get real bad. It's going to get real messed up. And then everybody's going to come at it in all kinds of ways because only a, a few people know it and they're trying to share it with everybody else. But because those other people don't know it, it you know, it, do I, am I making sense, y'all? Well, because my argument has always been, how can we avoid making the mistake of the past if we don't know what that past was? People are still talking about they want a separate country for white people and black yeah. people. Well, we've done so. And we've done separate, and that has never worked in the history of this country. So why do you think all of a sudden now, magically, that's going to be a logical solution instead of sitting down and talking and just addressing the ridiculous? When it's never been a solution. 
No, yeah, it, it's never been a solution. And I think it's important too. I mean, as you learn about the past, you've got to teach it. You've got to teach it correctly. Uh, I think it, it's just as important. Uh, I'm thankful Virginia in Utah uh, in the sense that, you know, we've kind of gone through this process over the last year with uh, our governor putting together a commission on uh, African-American history education in which we were able to um, have a group of educators, museum professionals, uh, preservationists from across the Commonwealth that really um, kind of went through our history curriculum uh, to make sure that it more, more positively reflect, reflected uh, the contribution of African Americans, um, that the standards in terms of what we were seeking to teach uh, were appropriately reflected. Um, Stumbled across, across the fact that I suppose those in power reflect uh, the contribution of African Americans. Um, that the standard. Oh, what happened? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it started repeating. I'm sorry about that, Cameron. Go oh, ahead. Oh, no problem. So yeah, so that that commission's work has been important um, in terms of what it will mean in the ways in which we teach African American history education, uh, the professional development that we will put behind investing in educators to teach that. Um, we've had the development of an African American history course that's being piloted in school districts across the state that will be more fully rolled out in the next academic year. Um, and so, you know, there's never been a more important and critical time for the country uh, to really double down um, on the ways in which we teach history. Uh, the lessons of the past have the ability to inform how we move forward in a profound way. And I would add to that, if a 16 year old black girl in 1951, and we know the history of this country, it's not easy, it's never been easy to be black and female. It's not easy being black and female today. Being 16 black and female in Jim Crow America, I swear. she had the strength and the fortitude to do what she did. We as adults, all adults, should be able to sit down and have the bravery and the fortitude to be able to tackle systemic racism. We should. We should. You're absolutely right. Well, it is four minutes till five. This was an awesome conversation. Um, Cameron, thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, for being on the show. And if ever you want to just get on the show again, you are more than welcome. Thank you. you know. I enjoyed this very much. Thank An you. hour goes by quick when you're uh, <laughs> having good conversation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, don't so I, I mean, maybe we should have them back on the show when, you know, once they do the unveiling or I don't know, something. Mm -hmm. some... Something to market. Yeah. Yeah. Something we can, maybe we can video it or I don't know, but I just think people need to definitely know her story and I appreciate you. Um, being able to tell her story. I'm so sorry Mr. Williams wasn't able to be on the show because he was actually someone who lived the whole situation. I think uh, um, if we do a follow-up, he is definitely one that I will bring back because uh, there's no one greater, uh, in my opinion, in terms of grounding what happens in, happened in 51 within the context of the broader civil rights movement and kind of helping to bring it present day. Um, so yeah, we'd love to have well, He's him. a great storyteller. He is one of the best. Okay, all right, okay. thank you. So before we bid you guys adieu, uh, Donnie and I have two, mess uh, two kind of um, announcements for you. So the first one, they're both show related. So the first one is uh, this coming Saturday, which is the 13th of February at 11.30 a.m. online. We are co-hosting a talk with um, Augs, New Jersey, the New Jersey chapter, about the lost connection between genealogy and history. So that's 
shaping up to be a really, really interesting discussion and so thrilled to be doing it in partnership with Augs, the New Jersey chapter. Yes. And, and then on the, you want to say it? No, nope, you go ahead. Okay, and then on that Sunday, on the 14th, we are going to be speaking with Dr. Henri Treadwell. Dr. Henri Tread blah, Treadwell um, was integrated the University of South Carolina. And she was also had some play in the Brown versus Board to a certain degree. So we're going to be talking about her. She was actually the first Black period. So she was the first black and she was the first black woman to enter into the University of South Carolina after the University of South Carolina also closed their school down for, was it two years, Brian? Mm -hmm. They did indeed. They did the same thing, Cameron. They shut it down. They were like, nope, I'm not doing it. And that was done, it was, what was that, 19? I can't think of the date. But they did the exact same thing um, that Robert Russell and well, that Prince Edward County did. They shut their school down. And um, she was the first person to integrate. And she was also the first African-American to graduate from the University of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be an awesome show. You guys need to definitely, you know, watch that. So all of this is in the events tab on the Geology Adventures page. Um, so you can do what you have to do to like it or subscribe to it to get your reminder, but um, all of our shows are up. So we hope to see you both on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and also the information about the AUGS New Jersey chapter is in that event post, how, how you can actually join it. So it's free, yeah. it's free, it's open to the public. All the instructions are in there. So until Saturday and Sunday, I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. Cameron, this was awesome. You can hold on for a little while if you want, but thank you so much. Thank you. You guys have a, enjoy the rest of your day.